please welcome Jessie Lloyd, Marcia Langton, for a cup of tea. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about this because gabardi, uh, gabardi is, um, is, is a word, it's an Aboriginal English word that um, means cup of tea. So, uh, and it's something that my family always kind of say, oh, you know, you're walking past the room and auntie sees you, hey, hey, gabardi, gabardi, go, go make her a cuppa. So, um, and it's a good sort of, you know, uh, way to, to share stories and to connect. So, we're going to have a cuppa. You're on coffee. Such a Melbourneite. Um, but it is instant, sorry, that's all we could do. <laughs> um, yeah, that was hurtful, eh? Instant coffee. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to sing a song called Gabardi to kick us off. Uh, and then we're going to have a chat. So the song will be a bit of an icebreaker. I'd like to introduce you to my Yukus Lalius. Yes, gender neutral. Uh, so this is Gabardi. And uh, some of you may know of the work I do with the Mission Songs Project. Well, this is a song that I kind of wrote when, in my younger days before I even thought of the Mission Songs Project in talking about... And my, my aunties, they used to sit around and having their cup of tea and you'd hear them talking, uh, how they like their man, like they like their tea. And so this has uh, inspired this song. Back in the days when the old ones were on the mission. They used to say life was hard as could be And every payday the government would hand out rations Rations of flour, rations of sugar and tea And we were wishing that they would tell us a story About how they used to make the best cup of tea and as we're sipping on a cup of black billy bushels The black follower for this drink is Gabardine I like my tea like I like my man Strong black and two of them I like my man like I like my tea White and sweet I like my tea like I like my man Strong black and two of them I like my man like I like my tea White and weak. Gabberty, gabberty. Gabberty, gabberty. One thing I learned from hearing all their stories. Make sure you appreciate the simple things. And next time someone asks you for a cuppa. Say Gabberty, and this is how I want it to be. I like my man, like I like my tea. Strong, black, and two of them, or three. I like my man, like I like my tea. White and sweet. I like my tea, like I like my man. Long Island iced tea. I like my man, like I like my tea. White and weak. Ooh, 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 ooh. Gabberty, 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 gabberty. Marcy Boko. So there we go. We're setting the scene for a cuppa and a yarn. So thank you very much for uh, hanging out with me, your busy schedule. Um, so uh, I was wondering if we could have a chat in front of um, these lovely people, uh, like we do normally, uh, about, uh, about you. So can you tell us, where were you born? I was born in the uh, Royal Women's Hospital in Brisbane. In Brisbane? I was born in Brisbane. 
Well, there you go. We might be. We re- might have been bought, born on the same ward. Yeah. Well, apparently, maybe, uh, maybe related. No, that's just blackfella <laughs> claiming, you know, just because at the same hospital. I'm going to make a cuppa while, while, while you do this. And um, where did you uh, go to school? Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can remember them all. Oh. I started at Inala. Oh, yeah. Inala Primary School when the suburb was first opened up, I think. The school was pretty new. Um, then I think we went to uh, Stanthorpe and I went to the, the Stanthorpe School or Happy Valley School, somewhere near there. Um, then we went to Duran Bandy. Uh, so I was in the Duran Bandy Primary School. Still have nightmares about that. Um, then Bolland, which is further west again. I was at the Bolland School. Then we came down to Brisbane on the train and I was at the Zilmia School. Then I was at the Aspley East Primary School and then the Aspley High School. So, a few schools. Just a few. Just a few. And uh, where did you, where'd you first go to university? The University of Queensland in 1969. And what was your subject? Or what was your thing? Uh, law, you degree thingy? L- law and arts. Law and arts. Yeah. Did you always I still have want... nightmares about that too. Oh. Yeah. That's why you work hard and don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you always want to be in, you know, academia? No. I, I did uh, conventional art subjects back then. Um, I think French. Um, I can't even remember them all. Oh, political science. I did political science. I did... S- so they were combined degrees. You did studies in both at the same time. Um, but then um, the police were hounding me. Why? In, why? Because I was a black radical. And, uh, and so they, they were terrifying. The, um, <clears throat> they were the undercover police in Queensland. And basically their job was to hound Aboriginal people to death and kill them if possible. So... I got pretty scared and I left the country. Wow. Mm. I went to New Guinea. You went to New Guinea? I went to New Guinea. That sounds even more scarier. Uh, Back then it was safer than Queensland. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Was New Guinea still part of Australia then? Yeah, it was a mandate of Australia. Because what had happened after the Second World War with the defeat of the Germans, the post-war settlement was that the German mandate over New Guinea on the uh, Papua New Guinea side was given to Australia. I had no idea. Yeah. So, yes, Australia was like a colonial power in, uh, in New Guinea. At, at, at that time? At that time when I was there, there, yeah. And wh- wh- who did you know in Papua New Guinea? Well, when I was at uh, the University of Queensland, I went to university with uh, the upcoming um, New Guinean leaders from oh. the Trobriand Islands, from all of, you know, the independence movements. They were all at the University of Queensland back then. So they, they said, come up to New Guinea. So I said, okay then. Wow. Got a plane to New Guinea. It was great. How long were you there for? Six months. Yeah. It would have been amazing. It was amazing. I went up into the highlands. I went, first of all, I was living in Port Moresby and I went to all of the debates at the Papua New Guinea University um, that were debates between one of the uh, New Gu- Trobriand Island leaders and the bishop uh, the Anglican Bishop of, um, of Port Moresby and uh, hundreds of New Guinean students turned up at the debates. So it was basically a debate about, you know, white civilisation versus black civilisation. And the Trabian Island leader was very well educated and very smart. What was the name? The, no, I'm trying to think of his name. Johnny Casapulova. Mm. Yeah. When was this? 1970. 1970? Yeah. Wow. And when did you come back? I didn't. I kept going. I went to Japan. Well, oh. I first, first of all, I went to uh, Hong Kong and then Taiwan and then uh, Japan. Wow. Mm-hmm. For just travelling or Yeah, for... because back then you could jump ships. So cargo ships... Oh, so you ships... didn't fly. You went on a boat. I flew to New Guinea, yeah. but after that I, I took ships. Now, I got a ship to, um, to Japan. So you could jump ships. Cargo ships had rooms for passengers. Yeah. 
and you know you could get a a, a berth on a cargo ship <clears throat> in the captain's wing, the captain's and officer's wing, for about uh, fifty dollars, and just you know travel on these ships all around the place. There were no rules back then. You didn't need a passport. Yeah, you needed a passport. I had a passport. Yeah, yeah. And uh, where did you go after Japan? Um, to Taiwan by ferry. Hmm. Hmm. I got the ferry to Were Taiwan. Were you working during this time? Well, what I did was uh, waitress. Um, I did artworks and sold them. So I knew how to make batik. Hmm. So I just, you know, do some lengths of material and sell them. Um, I was in I was in a Japanese television series as the baddie. Wow. Yeah. Actually, you do have a bit of an acting uh, career. Yeah. Uh, don't you? Yeah. Um, actually, I think the first one I, I saw you in was um, oh, you were somebody's growling mother. Yeah. Was that Redfern now or no? no. Um, that that Aboriginal woman was in a refuge. Yes, um, the Beck Cole movie. So it was Beck Cole's first feature film. Mm. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Can't think of it. I Sorry. am, or here I am, or here something. I am. Here yeah, I am. Here I am. You guys yeah. heard of that movie? Was that your acting debut? No, it wasn't. No. Ta- Japan. No, Japan. Did you have to speak Japanese? No, I had to be a really growly foreigner. You know, always being a nuisance. <laughs> that was that was their stereotype of the foreigner, right? Yeah. Foreigners are rude. They're a nuisance. They always, you know, make things go wrong. True. Yeah. So, you know, it was a, a spy movie. Oh. Yeah, a spy series. Have with... you got a copy of it? No. Oh, I don't want to see it now. <laughs> so every week I played, you know, some dreadful foreigner. So I'd be a passenger on a plane and, you know, I'd complain about the service and create a scene <laughs> while, you know, the main action was going down. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, wow. So, yeah, it was, they paid me for it. That's awesome. <laughs> and what else have you been in? Well, I, um, I studied um, mime. Ah. Yeah. Um, so I did a, a long... Um, a lot of training in mime... And then in Redfern, um, I was working at the Aboriginal Medical Service in 1976, I think, 1976. And up the road in Redfern was the Black Theatre. And so they uh, called for auditions for a play by Lester Bostock called Here Comes the Nigger. So um, I auditioned and I got the role as the... I don't know, I can't even remember now. Um, But that was fantastic. So we did a whole season at Black Theatre and Brian Brown was in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Black Theatre was uh, really a thing back then. It was amazing. It was run by Lester Bostock and um, his brother Jerry did a lot of Mm. work as well. So Jerry uh, had made that documentary. He was one of the um, directors or writers of that documentary, Lousy Little Sixpence. Okay. Yeah, they were very, the whole family was very talented. Um, and they were, you know, there were dance classes. So that NASDA started out at, at Black Theatre. Oh. Yeah. Back to you. What else have you been in? So one day the, um, the ABC came down to Black Theatre and they were looking for people to um, play roles in uh, an episode in a series called Pig and a Poke. Hmm. And so um, I was auditioned and I played the role of the um, receptionist at a, a medical clinic. Not at the Aboriginal Medical Service, but a, a medical clinic. Mm. And um, there was quite some famous actors in that. Um, and I learned a lot, actually, pl- doing these parts with um, very experienced actors like Brian Brown and, uh, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Who made um, The Last Wave? Peter Weir. Peter Weir Weir came down to Black Theatre to audition for The Last Wave. And um, many of the people in The Last Wave were auditioned at Black Theatre when we, you know, Mm. we were all doing that work with Lester. Mm. So it was a really wonderful time. Mm. Well, we did it all after work. 
we do the auditions after work and the um, the rehearsals after work, and you know we'd go straight from work and then you know cha- get into our parts and costumes and go on stage. It was yeah. very funny. Yeah. Well, in Here Comes the Nigger, there's a very violent scene. I think Brian Bra- Brown is the real baddie and he, um, or, or perhaps the other white character, and they're kicking the Aboriginal man on the ground. And they actually taught us how to do these fight scenes, how you make a fight scene look very authentic without causing anybody any damage. And uh, a lot of women had come down from... Um, northern New South Wales to see Athel, who was in the play, and Athel went on to play a role in um, The Last Wave, and um, <clears throat> they were, you know, fairly, you know, traditional women. Mm. Um, they thought it was a real fight, and they all carried their umbrellas with them all the time, and so they were jumping onto the stage <laughs> and whacking the white guys, get off my son, get off my... Oh. <laughs> so we'd, we have to calm them all down. We learnt that lesson. Calm everybody down before. Now, you're going to see things in this play. Yeah. You're going to think it's for real. It isn't. It's gammon, oh, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put your umbrellas away. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, martial arts, uh, uh, you've done some training yourself? Yeah. In what? Um, mainly karate, jiu-jitsu, taekwondo. Wow. When did you uh, start this? Well, I started when I was very young, about 12 in Zilmia. There was a uh, a club, a youth club, in the the old hall next to the railway station, and uh, a very beautiful old man ran judo classes for all the kids in the poor areas mm. um, to give them some discipline and you know a sense of their body and so on. So that, I started learning judo at age twelve from him. Yeah, because I remember, um, yeah, you were you were telling me about that one day when we uh, were walking your dogs. So you got, uh, you got you got two boys, Shinto and Finnegan. Yeah. And um, they're fur boys, fur babies, and they're chow chows. Yes. Why did you choose chow chows? Um, I didn't. Finnegan chose me. How? Well, he was about this big. Oh. And uh, fur ball. Yeah, he was a fur ball, and uh, I I met him. A, f- a friend of mine who bred him, Judith Ann, came down to Melbourne. With him, she did, we'd all been invited to a barbecue and she'd brought him along to, to socialise him and we just hit it off. And, uh, oh, you and Finnegan? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I asked if I could have him. She said, oh, no, no, you know, you have to be on a long list. These are very rare dogs and they cost a lot of money. Uh, and I was a bit heartbroken. Um, and then later on, he had a few things wrong with him. Um, and he had to have a couple of operations and she had to make the decision not to use him for breeding. Um, and so what happens with ethical breeders when they have that problem is they, they pet out their dogs. So he, he um, actually won a lot of prizes. I mm. showed him. Mm. Yeah. And, um, um, but he, couldn't, he was not never allowed to breed. And so, you know, at the right time I had to have him you know, fixed mm. so, so that he couldn't breed. But when he was young, he won a lot of prizes. Yeah. Yeah. And when did his brother uh, Shinto turn up? Japanese name? Well, I didn't Irish name him. I did, yeah, I didn't name him. Um, um, so he was another petted out dog mm-hmm. and his breeder over in Perth didn't want him anymore because he'd made champion when he was a puppy. But then when he reached full adulthood, his chest wasn't wide enough for the specifications. Oh. So... Um, I, I had said to Judith Ann, I really need a companion for Finnegan because he, he's a bit lonely. And um, so I got ended up with Shinto. And I got him when he was just over a year old. Um, and they, they, they had... You can't just bring a chow-chow into the house with another chow-chow. So oh, Judith they're two Ann, boys. Yeah, because they fight. Yeah. So Judith Ann had them at her house for a week to calm it all down because she knew how to train them. Um, but it was wild. Finnegan despised Shinto and just, you know, chased him down the hallway, knocked over furniture, rumbled across the room with him. Um, it took over a week to calm everything down. But then when Shinto arrived at my house for the first time, because he'd been in, you know, champion's quarters where it's very, very strict, um, and he was allowed to just run through the house, he couldn't believe it. He was so happy. Um, and Finnegan sulked, I think, for about 18 months that he had to share the house with Shinto. 
Oh, but now they're inseparable. Yes. The two that, boys. That only took about five years. And it took about five yeah. years. Yeah. yeah, no more. No more no. siblings no, for them. No, they're too hard. Too they're hard much work. too hard. And these are big dogs. Yes, big, big and very fussy. They only eat kangaroo mints. Mm. And they've got to have their vegetables in there as well. Now, um, I remember um, one time we were having a chat and we were talking um, about, I don't know if it was somebody like Bob Marley or... You said you'd seen them live? Yeah, I saw Bob Marley live. Yeah. I saw a lot of the greats live. Wh- when? Well, um, Bob Mar- As you know, my son used to come backwards and forwards from New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. And I went over to New Zealand to visit him often when he was young... And, you know, then he'd come back and see me. But I couldn't stand to be away from him for a long time. And then once when I was over there, Bob Marley did a tour of New Zealand. And so I went to the Bob Marley concert. That would have been awesome. It was awesome. And uh, you got two grannies in... uh, In New Zealand. In New Zealand. Yeah. Three, Um, actually. A grown-up one. He's uh, my son's foster boy. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, the two younger ones. So you go to New Zealand often? Yeah, I was just in New Zealand recently, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, you used to uh, tell, the, tell stories of um, when you used to travel up, up north in remote areas. Or was this sort of like a time when, when Native Title was just sort of coming in and you were... No, no long before, before that, long before that. In the 70s, I was working at the Aboriginal Medical Service in Redfern um, and... Uh, uh, for some reason, one year, there was no money to employ me at the medical service and I got a job at Bob Gould's bookshop. And um, somehow I met Fred Hollows and he called for volunteers to do the weekend trips into Western New South Wales to do eye checkups. So I went along as a volunteer on Fred Hollows' team before the National Trachoma Programme and I was a kind of a volunteer field officer, you know, driving people around, picking mm. them up and getting them to see the um, optometrist, the ophthalmologist and, um, and so on. And, of course, we, we ended up in Wilcannia um, during the floods there and the entire Aboriginal population had been evacuated to the, to the sports grounds. And then as the floods went down, um, we, we kind of got around to see everybody uh, and I, I loved uh, I love working with Fred so much. I then volunteered for the Arnhem Land trip um, after he um, set up the National Trachoma and Eye Health Program. Because he started to get an idea of how much trachoma there was. You know, it was pandemic at that time mm. in in the remote areas, like you know, and not so remote the rural areas as well. Mm. So I ended up in Arnhem Land um, just after the um, cyclone. So I was there in 76 in Arnhem Land. and went a Tracy? Yeah, yeah after Cyclone, Cyclone Tracy. Tracy yeah. And went across Arnhem Land with Fred's team doing um, eye checkups. So again, I was the field officer. And so that's when I ended up in remote Australia. Yeah, right. Yeah. Any uh, interesting stories from on the road? Um, lots of interesting stories. We were in Manangrida and Fred hadn't come home for two nights. So I started going around knocking on doors, asking people where he might be. Um, And they said, don't worry, he'll be all right. Don't worry about it. And, uh, you know, so what had happened was that he'd he'd basically, you know, headed off and ended up in some outstation and didn't want to come back into the settlement because he was enjoying himself so much. It was (laughs) back in the time before there were a lot of houses and so on and people were still living the traditional lifestyle in the... um, their um, structures up on stilts with oh. the and you know it was before the the art the boom in the art movement so their their roofs were bent very large pieces of bark mm. up on platforms very high platforms about fifteen feet high and and under the the bark were all the beautiful paintings that's where the bark paintings come from oh really yeah the roofs of their shelters. They'd lie on their backs and paint the roofs. Wow. Yeah. And there was a long pole with um, some, you know, parts cut out so that you could just walk up the pole. Oh, like the little And, and they'd burn the, um, 
one of the tree trunks underneath to keep the mosquitoes away. Um, they're those um, um, spear boy trees. The spear trees, you know, the spear trees? Oh, the yeah, they, they burn trees. the trunks. Yeah, the spear boy oh, trees. Oh, they're called ba balga trees. I oh, know, yeah, the, like that. Yeah. Yeah. So they burn the trunks of that to keep the mosquitoes away. Because mm. most of the outstations were next to a water hole. We'd rock up at, a, at an outstation and during the day you couldn't see anybody around. You just have to wait and then people would start appearing out of the forests and all the women would start appearing out of the water hole once we got there and then suddenly all the women come up out of the water hole. They'd all had their heads down collecting file snakes out of the, you know, the root systems mm. of the um, water lilies. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, a whirly-whirly came through their village and um, headed down past us to, to the river and they all stood up together and sang a song to the, to the whirly whirly. Oh, wow. And none of them could speak English except for two young girls who'd been into Camilda College. So they were our interpreters. Yeah. So it was like that back then. So, you know, I met David Gulpil on the road. Yeah. yeah. That's where I first met him. That was 77. So I fell in love with doing bushwork. Mm. And so then I decided, well, how can I keep doing this? So I did an anthropology degree at the ANU. I did Bachelor of Arts honours. Yep. with honours, uh, with a major in anthropology, sub-major in um, linguistics and history, so that I could work in the land claims. All oh, right, and this, and this is when you eventually moved to Darwin? No, I moved to Alice Springs you moved first. moved to Alice Springs yeah. first? Yeah, yeah. Much later I lived in Darwin, yeah. Yeah. And did you think, you know, did you think that sort of your, your career would go down this path? Or did you have sort of other ideas... And what you wanted to do? I always wanted to be a writer. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I thought I was going to be a great novelist. <laughs> that didn't happen. Well, you got a book here. That's not a novel. I know, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's a book. So, what, are you going to do a novel? No. Why? Novels are very hard to write. I ended up becoming an anthropologist and, you know... Um, so once you get academically trained, it's very hard to switch back to creative writing. No. How many very... books you got? Uh, Self-authored books. Um, I can't... I'm trying... I'd have to... Like 10? No. 20? No. Three? No. I've, I, well, I've edited... I've edited a few books. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So quite a few edited collections um, arising from... Um, research projects and, of course, uh, the edited book with Megan Davis, It's Our Country, on constitutional recognition, um, Honour Among Nations on, um, you know, agreements and treaties. That's an edited book. Um, Settling with Indigenous Australians is the second one in that series. The third one, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. We did a book on mining, um, Foundations for Indigenous People in the Mining Boom. That was published by Routledge. I did um, First Australians with Rachel Perkins. Oh, That's yes. an edited collection. My self authored books are um, Burning Questions. Well, I heard it on the radio and saw it on the television about mm -hmm. Aboriginal filmmakers mm -hmm. and television makers. Back in 1994, that was published. Burning Questions was published in 98. That's about the Aboriginal land management system up north and, and the... Um, using fire to, to control mm. fire. Mm. Um, my Boyer Lectures, The Quiet Revolution, um, which is not all about the mining industry. It's, you know, there's also a, one of the lectures... I extended all the lectures into chapters in, in the book, uh, but one of them is about, you know, the contribution that Aboriginal people have made to environmental conservation. Mm. This one, Welcome to Country. Um, there are some others, I'm trying to think. Can't remember them that's all. A, that's a that's a good effort. No novels. <laughs> that's a good. That's that's all right. No, but you know, are you and uh, lots of chapters in other people's books. Yeah, yeah. So you write a lot. But I suppose you know, in university, you have to write all the time. Yeah. I remember she helped me once write something. I don't know a grant I did for something, and yeah, you totally re-edited it, everything, and it was like awesome. Yeah, so you should help me more often. <laughs> it was good. Get a professor to write it, yeah. So you got this new post at uh, University of Melbourne. 
It sounds pretty flash. Can you explain what it is? Because I don't know what it is. So um, I've been a professor there for many years. Um, so I'm now uh, I spend half my time as associate provost. Provost? What's so a provost? A provost, uh, typically in Australian universities, is the person who um, has the responsibility for the academic program of the university. Um, but as associate provost, because Indigenous Studies crosses the academic program and the engagement program, I, you know, am engaged in several projects across the university. So I go to the Reconciliation Action Plan meetings, although I'm not the responsible person. Um, our partnerships with communities, um, the Goulburn Valley, we have the annual Dungala Kayela Oration in Shepparton. Oh, yes. Um, we have the annual NAM oration in Melbourne. That's our um, signature Indigenous Studies lecture and we invite great thinkers from mm. the Indigenous world in Australia and overseas to deliver the NAM oration. Um, our partnership with the Yothi Indi Foundation um, and our attendance at the Garama Festival. Yeah. You're, um, you're, pretty, you're kind of like the hostess with the mostest at Garama Festival. Well, I'm the... Um, I, has I, anybody been... To Garama Festival, and you see, yeah, she just runs the show. Yeah. No, well, I don't because the, there are many parts to Garma, but my job for, since 2005 has been to um, curate and be the facilitator of the key forum. The facilitator. The yeah. forum, yeah. yeah. So I've been pushing people to take on roles. Younger people were very shy about taking that on, but now they nearly run the whole thing. Mm. The only reason why I get up on stage is because a clan hasn't shown up or they're running late or a speaker hasn't shown up. Mm. Now, I really actually have very little to do, in fact, unless yeah. people don't turn up. I just it's an interesting festival. Yeah. It's not like a normal festival. Mm. It's kind of like a yeah, cause so, you know, you politician were in the, festival. Well, politicians, corporate leaders, academic leaders, you know, NGO leaders yeah. and ordinary citizens turn up. Um, you know, and a couple of thousand Yolngu people and Aboriginal people from elsewhere in the country turn up. But, you know, you were part of the music program. The music program's mm. huge, um, mm. and I don't have anything to do with that. There's the cultural program, including the bungal every day, the ceremonies, oh, yep. you know, um, the art program. So there are art exhibitions, um, and, and that's expanded out into artists having their own shelters all around the grounds now. Mm. Um, and so you can actually do a tour of um, all of the um, art shelters being run by artists from mm. all around Australia. Yeah. And there's the youth festival and, you know, so much more. Yeah. And uh, you get into a bit of business as well because um, you're in, we were involved together with the uh, Mara mm -hmm. uh, Indigenous Business over at Melbourne Business School. Yes. Um, so, um, I mean, you keep pretty busy, got a lot of, lot of things on, yes. the, on the board. Well, there are a lot of programs at the University of Melbourne, so mm. I really love the Murrah Business Program, mm. which is led by Pro Associate Professor Michelle Evans. And, you know, I've always encouraged young Indigenous entrepreneurs to get into that program. It's fabulous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I did the, uh, the, the course. It's really good. It's and, good. and so I, what I've done is... Uh, convinced the university and the National Native Title Council to extend the program for, by a couple of modules to include the native title world so that native title holders can mm. um, have some business acumen to convert their native, new native title assets into income streams, mm. which is partly what this book is about. Cool. Yeah, tourism on country. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and I think it's like sort of really forward thinking uh, kind of stuff, you know, setting all these things up and aligning them. Uh, I wanted to um, ask you, can you give me three career highlights so far? I think going to the Central Land Council as a baby anthropologist and then ending up running the, what we call the Development Planning Division and, um, you know, managing land claims, sacred site protection, environmental conservation and business development. That was a great career highlight. Mm. Um, I ended up then after that in the Queensland government when GOSS came to power 
and I hooked up with the people from Cape York and I, after a disastrous time with um, the Queensland Government, I ended up um, back at Macquarie University teaching and then when the Mabo decision was handed down, they rang me and said, get up to Cape York as soon as you can. So I ended up in Cape York in early 93 and then started doing field work and we lodged um, our, our land claims under the Aboriginal Land Act and I lodged the first native title claim in Cape York with the, the team that we had at the Cape York Land Council over the um, Daintree National Park on mm. behalf of the eastern side, Gugiyalanji. Mm. And then I guess, you know, being... Well, then I was at the old Northern Territory University, which is now the Charles Darwin University and now the University of Melbourne. But I think the University of Melbourne has been the best part of my career, really. Mm. That's awesome. Uh, we're going to um, finish up soon. Uh, but I, I just... Uh, I wanted to have this chat um, because I, I always get inspired hearing about... Uh, you know, the work that you've done and your adventures along the way. And uh, with this year's NAIDOC theme of Because of Her, We Can, it's definitely because of you. You know, we can. Because of you, I can. So, um, yeah, thank you for being awesome. And, um, yeah, it's... Uh, I have a final question, though. Uh, and this is the most important question uh, at a, at a Gabardee session is... Do you like your man like you like your tea? I have buddies. So I have my art buddies, that Brooke Andrew there. I have my film buddies, that's Jock Given over at Swinburne University. Um, um, can tea be um, interesting and smart and, you know, good company? Yeah. Yeah. No, that didn't answer my question. Milky... Um, Sweet. Two tea bags, not one? Two tea bags. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, well, thank you. Round of applause, please, for uh, Marcia Langton. This is the first Gabardee session, so very happy. And um, I'm hoping some of you can come over and see Aunty Marlene Cummins' uh, performance. She's also um, an amazing auntie and inspiration and I'm just very, very lucky to be hanging around some awesome, awesome women and um, want to in invite you along to be a part of it. So thank you again. You rock. Thank you.